Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Mr. Reese, for being here with us today. This is a complicated issue, and um, I, appreciate, I appreciate your insights and the deep thought that the administration has given to uh, the thank most you. productive way forward. Uh, and just to, to sort of frame this in a slightly different path, uh, I think what, uh, impact, what happens in Puerto Rico, as you have said, at the very least in sort of the out-migration that's taking place, uh, will come, come and, and be part of our country, and my district is very reflective of that. Uh, one in five of my constituents identify as Hispanic or Latino, and 40 percent of them are from Puerto Rico. So many of them have friends and family who still live there, and they've seen firsthand uh, the devastating effects that the 10-year recession uh, and the debt crisis have had on the island. Uh, so this is something that for those of us who represent uh, significant Puerto Rican populations have to take very seriously what the most productive way forward is. And a lot of the debate is whether a voluntary agreements, or really I think the crux of the debate is really whether voluntary agreements alone are a sufficient way forward uh, versus whether you need to have the option, a restructuring option uh, at hand as well. And again, you've given some testimony to this effect, but again, I'd like your thoughts as to the many complexities of the voluntary path, in, it's solely that path, without the, op the restructuring option at hand. Well, and I'll give you some time to answer that. <laughs> thank you, Congresswoman. The, um, and that is the right way to frame the question in our judgment. So today, without any tools to restructure the debt, Puerto Rico is faced with 20 different creditor classes and 18 different issuers with competing claims. On December 1st, just to take one example, the governor decided to not pay three debts in order to pay other debts. This has immediately prompted litigation by the three debts who were not, three creditors who were not paid. As this unfolds and the maturities come that Congressman Pierre Luisi was referring to, this will magnify and intensify. And there are really two major problems in a voluntary discussion. First, is that there is no stay on litigation. And so litigation as to priority of payment, as to uh, eligibility uh, for any particular agreement will ensue. And the second is that there is no way to reach agreement with a majority of creditors in, an, in any given class and know that the holdouts, that the minority creditors will go along. And there have been many examples of this around the world and we do worry that the compounding effects of litigation and an inability to conclude agreements with any creditor class could turn a purely voluntary process into a decade-long crisis. And so that restructuring authority that you mentioned is really what's needed at the back end. We support an initial period of voluntary discussions. We think that those voluntary discussions can only succeed with this kind of back-end authority. And what, what it would be the impact on the citizens of Puerto Rico if, and the, and the, the lengthy process of a vol you know, solely voluntary way forward? What would be the impact on the citizens? I mean, the governor has already been forced to curtail services, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. As the debt payments become larger, as the most senior debt becomes due, 800 million of constitutionally protected debt on July 1st, the decisions become more difficult and the litigation becomes more severe. And this is not lost on the citizens of Puerto Rico. And again, and you have them, uh, you have them in your district, but I can tell you that our fellow citizens in Puerto Rico are acutely aware of the kind of trade-offs that the government could face if these maturities come due, litigation builds, and the services need to be traded off against constitutionally protected debt. Thank you for your testimony, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Zinke.